Welcome to Ideas at Work and Beyond. Today's topic, dissecting Danbury and the United States of America. My name is Ivan Alsme, your host, and Marty Heiser. Good to see you, Ivan. Co-host, how you doing? Good. It's been a while since I've been. I know, you've been sort of like behind the scenes, like the Wizard of Oz, the guy behind the curtain, moving all the levers, uh, directing the show, bringing in exciting guests, but I like you better in front of the camera myself. Uh, you think so? Yes, I do. Why, because I'm very Because you mean, you bring your unique perspective, you're highly educated, you're getting your PhD at Howard University, uh, uh, and no, you have a certain international perspective uh, that I really appreciate. Ha! Okay, let's, let's bring it down locally, right? Okay, locally. Okay. Dissecting Danbury. Dissecting, there's a lot of issues in Danbury. And Danbury is, I guess it depends on who you talk to. It's a tale of two cities, yes. I think. That's what people talk about. I mean, I've talked to some people in Danbury and they say, hey, economy's doing good. Okay. We've got commercial construction going on. Okay. New businesses are opening up. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems as if uh, taxes are coming in okay. And then you talk to other folks and they said, wow, since ICE has come in, since there's sort of been all this sort of anti-immigration talk, we're going the way of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, where they've seen businesses flee and, and uh, uh, just spending gone down and a sense of anxiety in the air. Um, I don't know. I guess it's a tale of two cities. I don't know who... Uh, I spoke earlier uh, today, actually, to Mayor Boughton, who, by the way, okay. is uh, said he is he'll come in and join us for the full hour on uh, May first, Thursday, ah, May first. Okay. So mark your calendars; that'll be a red letter day. <laughs> and we've also had conversations with, well, not conversations, but left voicemails with other certain high officials in the state that we're trying to book for this show. Absolutely. Well, we can't announce anything. Right. But Mayor right, Bowden's right. no, uh, you know, small fish, so he's going to come in and talk about the budget. But in conversations with him. He seems to think that times are tough nationally, okay. um, but that the economy in, in, in the town of Danbury seems to be moving along fairly well. Okay. Um, it, there's some difficulties, but uh, he seemed rather upbeat. Yes, and that will be determined when they pass the budget yeah. for the fiscal year starting in June. Yeah. yeah. So. If, the, if Denbury is doing well, then is there a need to increase taxes? Well, that's is the thing. Is there a need to lay off people? This is, and, and, and again, you know, Mayor Broughton, by the way, the phone number here is 792-4101, uh, 792-4101. Mayor Broughton has called in before. Absolutely. Uh, he's a very busy man, but he will be in. Uh, I think we have him penciled in for May 1st. But uh, what he said is that the town of Danbury, the city of Danbury, is faced with increasing costs, especially in the area of gas. Okay. I mean, they, they, you, there's just no way around it. You're paying $4 a gallon for gas, even more for diesel. And he's saying that those expenses continue to go up. The school board uh, or the board of ed expenses continue to go up. So he says that there's a 5% increase in their $202 million overall budget which translates into a 6% tax increase. He said no services are being cut. This mm -hmm. is the mayor now. He says that they are allowing a natural attrition of people that are retiring and then trying to find economy of scales within these various city departments that allow for efficiencies and allow for lower cost of government. So he says there aren't any mass firings of people. Services aren't being cut, but they're allowing attrition to take its toll. So when the news time reported that there will be uh, some some layoff, the news time was actually lying? I don't know. I, I mean, you're getting this sort of secondhand. It'll be very interesting okay. when Mayor yeah, Bowden calls, or calls yeah. in or comes in and he can, can clarify that. But he did say to me today that there aren't, uh, there aren't layoffs but and that there is some attrition. Here's the interesting thing, okay? So there's a possibility, we don't know, there's a possibility mm -hmm. that they will increase taxes. However, yeah, it looks like six percent is in the cards. Right, six percent. I, I think it's not six percent. It's going to be um, in the long term. Like every year, they will add. Mm -hmm. um, Become cumulative over cumulative the years. Over the years, right? Yeah. The uh, here you go. You taxes increase, right? Yeah. And services decrease. So, well, he said there's no. Okay. Well, I, I'm well, he sorry. Said it, 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 was, it was still the same. Right. But the thing is this, though. The paycheck stays the same. Yes. Some people are getting laid off. Yeah. Um, the housing market is not 
is not doing well. Yeah. So if you're gonna increase taxes, who's gonna pay for it? And he and, and, and guess what? Certain industry mm -hmm. are still getting tax breaks. Yeah. So you wonder if um, if the right thing is being done. But we have a yeah. call. We have oh. a call. Love all right, caller, so, you in the air. Yeah, how you doing? Um, I have a question for you. Go I have uh, been around, uh, say, up north and whatever, but I see city city vehicles that uh, property uh, people own, or um, can I say, drive from Bridgewater or wherever from, you know, they own the city of Danbury has the vehicle that they own driving, you know, back and forth to to and fro work. Uh huh. Using, you know, why can't they use their cars to get to work and then use the vehicles from the city of Danbury just to, instead of using them to get back and forth to work, you know, they work either live out of town or whatever. But uh, caller, uh, without stating your name or anything, do you mind if I ask what do you what do you do for a living? I'm an arborist. A what? Arborist. An arborist. So does your company give you a vehicle that you're allowed to take home, to home at night and nope. take on weekends, nope. take your kids to birthday nope. parties and things like that? Nope. But the color has a point yeah. because... No, if, I'm, I'm on your side. Right. I, I think it's... Uh, the color has a point. You know, if you, I, it, I'm up that way and I see somebody driving a city vehicle getting back and forth to work. <laughs> I mean, out of town. Coming out of Costco. Yeah, and, with, and, and then uh, here, <laughs> right, see, um, for, um, um, through... Through Marty, from the mayor, I, the mayor stated that the, the, the city has to fit the cost of high um, cost of, um, of gas. Fuel, yeah, that's a big right. problem. Well, right. So prices, well, there's one way to uh, eliminate a little bit of the fuel prices. Why should we pay for him to drive back and forth to wherever he lives in out of town, Bridgewater, per se? That's an interesting I, point. Good point, Carl. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, hold on. That's an interesting point. Um, so, so the mayor should be driving his car to City Hall, right? Why not? Why right? not? Exactly. I drive my car back and forth to work, pay my insurance, my gas, my this and that. Why shouldn't uh, you? That would cut down on the cost of. Um, interesting. interesting. That's good point. We can ask the mayor. Yeah. Um, I, I know in Ridgefield, I think. Don't quote me on this, but there was like 27 town vehicles, and of that nine, they had a policy where they could take it home at night. The fire chief, the tree mm -hmm. warden, uh, I think the police chief. Um, I uh, understand that because they're kind of emergency situations right. where they get involved in, you know, uh, windstorms, uh, fires, you know, they, you know, in order for them to go back to get the vehicle to take to the emergency would yeah. be a big, you know. No, I know what you're saying, though. It does it does give one pause. Um, just to drive a SUV or a smaller SUV, whatever. I see them up that way and whatever, driving around. And there's, you know, why should they get the opportunity to do that? I don't have a vehicle. I have to pay my insurance, my gas, my whatever. I'm, making, I'm, I'm making a note. Call We're going to ask the mayor. City you, cars to and fro. You have a yeah, point. Out of town. Especially, I mean, all the way up to Bridgewater and back, and why should they get the free expense when uh, and we have to pay for it? Thank you very much. All right, we gotta Thanks go, but, but but but, Caller, oh, right here. Oh my bad. Yeah. Caller, make <laughs> sure you call City Hall and, and tell them about this. All right. Thank you. Next call. Caller, you're there. Hi, Ben. It's your friend Frank. All right, Frank. Behave now. I always say, Marty, buddy. How Hi. you doing? Good, good. Good to hear your voice. I like to talk to my fellow former Florid Floridian. He's, he was Bay and I was Monroe County. Do you know that, Marty? <laughs> is that Flo oh, oh, Tom, oh. Tom, uh, <laughs> He's from the Bahamas. His family's from the Bahamas. I'm is that right? Uh, the, the, we go way back. It's you a know. small world. But anyway, <laughs> I haven't lived in Dade County for a few years, right? Yes. Dade County, Florida, yes. where they Miami, don't know uh, uh, how to vote with paper ballots. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to live in Monroe County, which is south of Dade County, Marty, in case you don't know your Floridian history. <laughs> I have a vague idea. I know Key West is all the way at the bottom, and that's where Ernest Hemingway was. That's where I was, too. I live right across the street from him. Get out. Did you see the cats with the, like, five toes or something like that? Oh, I got to tell you, in 1980, 1982, um, I've been, we succeeded from the Union, um, 1982 this day. Did you know that, Ivan? What, Key West? Yeah, we down there at, down, the down there with all the jugglers and everything at yeah, Sunset were, and Sloppy were, Joes and... The, uh, the, uh, 
they were harassing our police and the fire department when they were in, when they were bringing in marijuana. They were arresting our police. You want officers. law enforcement? You go to Key West. They're they're big on law enforcement. I mean, you were there, Tom. It's true. <laughs> Look, I don't know what you're I mean, talking about. Is there anything about, you'd man. like to talk about with marijuana <laughs> importation in Key West? Ivan, buddy, we're all suffering from property taxes. Exactly. Okay. The reason why we have high property taxes. We have a disproportionate amount of civil servants on the state level and on the local level. Here we go. In All right. Florida, I've been, you, so, do you still receive the Miami Herald online? Yes, I still read it every day. That is correct. I read it every day, too. Now, we have, they have a hardcore, good, hardworking Cuban state legislator there. What's his name, Ivan? I don't know. All right, and I forgot it, too. But he's up there. They're getting rid of property taxes in Florida. Are you aware of that, Ivan? I thought they didn't no. have it. Well, they don't have state income they tax. Don't, they don't have an income tax because the tourist industry pays offsets. But there's still a surplus of civil servants. So what they did is they gave the people of Florida a choice. We could either, we could either have all these civil servants on the county and state and, and uh, local level that are able to retire after 20 years with excellent benefits, or we could slice the number and cut it down 20% and eliminate the property tax on homes. So it's not a law yet, but they're working on it. it was, it's, it's a state senator Rubio. That's his name, right. Ivan. Okay. Rubio. Okay. Does that sound okay. familiar? Yeah. 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 So the people of Florida had enough of with property taxes. They said, we'll do with less services, less state civil servants. It'd be a benefit of the majority of the people of Florida. And uh, I hope it goes through. They have a super majority Marty, of Republicans in both houses, so they're able to you know, do what's in the... They have a very popular governor down there that seems to be very fiscally conservative as well. Well, I won't go that far, Marty. But well, I mean, don't I, worry. He's going to be vice president with John McCain anyway, so maybe they'll be able to I don't put think some. McCain's going to be around too much longer, to tell you the truth, with two cancer scares. I yeah. would vote for him. Him and the Pope. Mar 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 They'll I'm be dead a couple of years. Bar, I can tell you the truth. The other people, <laughs> if you saw yesterday's Democratic debate, they both support terrorists. You saw yesterday's debate, right, Ivan? Yeah. That, that, look, was, look, that was man. a little tough to watch. But I have a keep on receiving the Miami Herald. You'll see my notes. <laughs> Do you see what I write in? Can you tell which is my language? I'm, go I'm going to read the comments you section. you read the comments. You'll know which one is me. <laughs> All right. Now, listen, people. You're human cattle. You keep on voting for these Democrat legislators to pick your pocket. And the Republicans are too stupid to do anything about it. So the Republicans <laughs> in Florida support their base. Okay, thank you. There are, dude. I heard, uh, I heard a mooing <laughs> cow back there. Is there a, there's sheep or goat coming through the studio. Uh, we spending trillions of dollars. Trillions of dollars, yeah. In Iraq. Just, let's take some of that money, invest it back into the country, save the economy, and use the oil from Iraq to build that country. I don't understand it because to me it's common sense. You know, take the troops, protect the oil. Well, I, I think I think they're doing that. I mean, and and use that money. We shouldn't. We should not use the taxpayers' money to save Iraq when it's a very rich country. It, let me tell you something. Once once all that um, um, fighting stop, it will probably take less than a year. To, a, to, yeah. to, to really unfortunately that Unfortunately, that fighting has been money. going on for about 2,000 years, yeah, and we're coming at money. it a little late, and I don't know how so. much we're going to be able to uh, institute a democracy there, but hopefully we will be able to. But at the end of the day, in Iraq, there is the petroleum that's available. Gas is now, well, oil is $115 a barrel, something like that. So there is ready Isn't that money. amazing? We it really is amazing. We have our loved ones, son, Sis, um, daughters, sisters, mm -hmm. brothers, uncles, nuts, dying. Yeah. For what? Well, I have a, I have a pretty uh, cogent argument for why we went into Iraq and why it's important to address state-sponsored terrorism wherever it rears its ugly head. Yeah. And I think the world is probably I, a safer I, okay, place. Okay, now Saddam Hussein is dead, right? Well, right. Saddam Hussein right. is, is dead. dead. The so, Ba'ath Party is out of power, right. and the existing Iraqi government poses so, no so, threat so to the United why States. Exactly. So why don't we use their natural resources, resources to build their own country, mm -hmm. and then take that trillion dollars, invest it back into the country? Well, I'll I tell think you, that's I, a plausible thing to do. I think. Now, I have some. I, actually, I, I, I learned this. Do you know that the Iraqi government is running a thirty billion dollar surplus? 
Yeah. Thirty billion dollar yeah. surplus. Let's take some of that money. I think right? we need to get access to some of that money. But bear <laughs> okay. in mind, when uh, when Iraq was first invaded, well, the second time, the first thing they did is sent Navy SEALs to secure the spigot out in the Persian Gulf where that oil comes out. Mm -hmm. So that was secured, and there's funds available. Uh, to be to have the United States be reimbursed and to have that country invested in. Can we take the call? Let's take the call. Let's, let's yeah. try to stay local also. Let's try to stay local. Call, you're on the air. Hey, this is Larry from Danbury. Hey, Larry. Larry from Danbury. Now, he just visited the Middle East, if it's Larry I'm thinking of. Larry, Here's good. Larry you're thinking of, Marty. And uh, Ivan, it's also good to talk to you both. I'd just like hey, to make a Larry. couple of comments. First, Marty, I find it stunning that you would say that you're not sure that we're going to be able to implement democracy in Iraq. Of course, if that is not the case, well, I'll ask you, if, that's the ca if that is not the case, would you argue that we should be pulling out? That's one question. Well, we'll take it one at a time. That's the first question. Okay, do you want me to answer one at a time or get them all out on the no, table? No, no, we'll do it one at a time. Okay, democ right democracy now. in Iraq. I don't think democracy in Iraq is going to look anything like Republicans versus Democrats, placards on front uh, lawns and televised debates. I think it's going to be a quasi-religious tribal, which you really got to understand in the Middle East. It's all about Sunni, Shia, Kurds. That's where people's affinities and their their attractions and hey, allegiance Larry? are. So I don't think it's going to be an American or westernized type democracy. I do believe that it will be a representative form of government. And I think that the Iraqi people, remember those uh, purple fingers where they stuck their finger in once they, they voted? They risked their lives to be willing to have their vote counted. So I think there will be a democracy. It probably won't look anything like the U.S. democracy. Hey, Larry? Yes. Um, define democracy. Because from what I understand, Iraq had democracy before the United States even became a country. So please define well, democracy. Well, Iraq, uh, Ivan, is a cobbled together country uh, through the British, um, I believe it was in 1923. So it's not, I mean, I mean Iraq was really, it, it's, it's not a country like the United States or even a country like England where you really had a shared epic or a common um, ideology. It was just, we're going to take the Sunni areas, the Shiite areas, the Kurds up north, and we're going to put them together, and we're going to couple together, a, you know, a country. So I don't think there, would e there was ever, you know, democracy. Um, but how would, you define, how would you define democracy, though? Well, again, it would be where the, uh, you know, where the world of people determine, determine who the individuals are who are going to be governing the people. I mean, that, that would be, you know, with essentially with the rights of the minorities, you know, somewhat, you know, somewhat guaranteed. Um, that, that's how I would, you know, in essence, define democracy. And Marty, and I don't want to spend all this time in Iraq, but I, I, would, I would so much take issue with you in that um, the whole point of the United States coming in is that you would hope that these various factions, if you've read the Seven Pillars of Islam, you realize why the Sunni and the Shia really are at loggerheads against each other because they, they're coming at things from different areas or from different viewpoints that we didn't have a U.S. style democracy where people agree to the basic rights of the minorities that it's not going to work. And I'm not, I don't feel certain um, you, you know, that, that that is what you're going to see. You hear, for hey, example, hey, um, hey, uh, Larry? what's his name? Um, the guy who runs the Mahdi Army. Um, uh, I'm looked at Sadr. First he says, let's, let's co cooperate with the Americans. Secondly, he says, then he says, well, we're not going to cooperate with the Americans. So these guys, I guess they are like Democrats and Republicans because they somewhat... <laughs> But that's, that's one point I, I just... I yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, I mean, what we're looking for is a, is a stable, non-threatening Iraq. That's what we're looking for. And, uh, and we probably think democracy is the best way to get there, uh, but it's not going to be a democracy exactly like we have in the United States, nor should we hold out until we get that. I think we just need to have some sort of stability there, some sort of self-governance there, and, uh, and have them not be a potential threat to the United States, which I think that they did. And may I add that at the same time that we went into Iraq, I think Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, got religion on uh, being a state sponsor of terrorism. He gave up all his nuclear uh, programs that he was starting. And uh, now it's a, a join the community of nations. Um, and I think that was the outcome. And I think we've essentially achieved that outcome, which is good. Hey, Larry. Yes. Um, let me say two things. Uh, you, you were talking about um, 
democracy is basically the, um, to achieve the basic right for minorities, right? No, no, I said it's the will of the people, the will of the majority with the rights of the minorities protected. Okay, you know, I wish that America did that without the, the struggle of the civil rights movement back in the 60s. Agreed. You know, um, which, which, which was a continuation since, since slavery. Second, um, Iraq will never, never achieve democracy. However, you know, which, whichever form of democracy that they, uh, that they want to implement, without going back, actually, the basic, the basic to their democracy will be their religion, because you have all these different, um, they are Muslim, but within the Muslims, they are divided. You have to assume that. They're tremendously reason. divided. Right. Yeah, right. but. Yeah, it's the end. Hold on, hold, hold on like for a second. Hold on for a second. It's not like Orthodox Jews and Reform Jews. You know, I can recall reading in Time Magazine, I'll just use this as an example, where they asked a Shiite man, and he, he said, and not an insurgent, not by any means a terrorist, but he said if he saw a Sunni child walking across the bridge, he would go, he would get chains, he would take the child, wrap him up in chains, throw him over the bridge, into the water, and cheer as he died. I mean, that's a... Uh, I read, yeah, I was in Time Magazine, Marty. But no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, and, and uh, Larry, no, there are Larry, intense listen, tribal hatreds listen, in that country <laughs> Larry, that go back for generations. Hey, my point I'm making is this, okay? We are wasting American lives, I, okay? Yeah. For, listen, right, to implement democracy, right? But, guess what? If your religion, your faith, is not in line, you know, with, with, with the basic doctrine of of them, um, everyone should have the right to breathe. What's the point of sending somebody else's kids over there and fight a senseless war? It doesn't I, make any you. sense. I, I agree with you completely. So, so we well, need to send a message down to DC. Yep. Because yeah. I mean, if I could just touch on a couple of other. Go ahead. Go ahead. The time, but I did want to uh, monopolize on a couple of other points. The prior caller, this gentleman, Frank. Uh, you know, was making notice about, uh, or made some note about John McCain, mm -hmm. and I, know, I think it was Marty who mentioned that, you know, John McCain was likely to be the next president, and he was talking about tax policy. If you heard John McCain recently, he came out with, we have to abolish the alternative minimum tax. Uh, I know it hit a lot of people pretty hard, you know, given that we recently thought that they recently had to complete their tax returns. My question to you is as follows. If that is the case, then one, how one, how is the revenue that is going to be lost by the AMT being um, tossed out going to be replaced? And two, if you really wanted to reform the alternative minimum tax, wouldn't indexing be a better tool than just plain elimination? Well, um, well basically my, my uh, feeling on this is we pay too much in taxes. Do you know the average worker has to work until May 15th of every year just to pay his state, federal, and local taxes? Okay. Yeah, tax saving day. It, it, it's true. And, and I think uh, the, uh, the tax that you were referring to can become unfair to certain groups of taxpayers. If, if, for example, you're working and then all of a sudden your wife starts working and you combine those two incomes, you end up uh, paying higher taxes. And I don't necessarily think that that's completely fair. I think we pay way too much in taxes. Well, the minimum, As a matter of fact, what I, you're referring to is the marriage penalty, which has been around for quite some time. Right. Uh, no, no, and, and, and I'm certainly in regard, in regard to, I totally in agreement with you on, on agreement with you on that. My point being is that to make a comment such as we're going to eliminate a particular tax, you have to look at tax policy in its totality. Right. As opposed to we're just going to eliminate this tax. So By the way, he, he also suggested that we eliminate all federal tax on gasoline over the uh, summer driving months of, I think he said, June through yes, September. That's also true. What's Again, that? I, no, I'm, I'm just suggesting. I mean, that might be a political year stunt, but I like his I like his angle. I mean, the one thing, and I don't know if I can call you a Democrat or a liberal Democrat or what have you, but the one thing that Democrats sense is the way we need to get more revenue to the government is to somehow raise taxes. And it's much better if we don't raise taxes on you or me, but we raise taxes on the guy behind the tree who supposedly has all the money in the world. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to increase revenue to the government, cut taxes. John F. Kennedy did it, and it worked well. Uh, Ronald Reagan did it in the 80s, and they doubled the revenue 
uh, to, the, to the federal government. And this past year, the federal government, with Bush's tax cuts in place, has received more revenue than they ever have in the, probably in the history of the planet. So the idea is taxing more can actually reduce revenues to the government. It might at some level during a, a, a political season uh, benefit certain politicians. They say if you take from Peter and give to Paul, you can usually count on Peter, or you can usually count on Paul's vote. But I don't think that that's a progressive tax policy to try and figure out how we can tax people more. We should be looking at how we can cut taxes. Wow, Marty, that, was, that sounds just like out of the Arthur Laffer uh, supply side playbook. Well, it's true. All right, let me ask you something, Larry. Oh, no, I, no, I'll let you. You ask me a question. Let me ask you a question. Were revenues to the government doubled in the 1980s? Marty. The issue yes, were they? Marty. I'll answer. The answer is yes. And, the, and did Ronald Reagan dramatically cut the income tax on, on average Americans? Dramatically. Okay. Where, where prior to that, people were paying 80, 90 percent okay. in the higher tax bracket. Well, Marty, again, you have to look at things on the margin. I mean, I think we can all agree. LBJ put in the, uh, it was the, I think it was, there's a 91% maximum tax rate. Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously there, there it clearly acts as a disincentive. If you think? No, no, no. There, there's no issue there. Okay. The question that you have to ask is, yes, everyone in general says, gee, I'm for lower taxes. What you have to do is determine, they call it dynamic scoring determine how any particular increase or decrease in the tax rate is going to impact overall governmental revenues, as well as providing uh, what we call aggregate supply, the total amount of goods and services that are going to be produced in the economy. When taxes become too aggressive or too harsh, then seriously they're going to be lowered. If we can agree that a government, to a certain extent, requires a certain degree of funding, and that funding is going to be received through some sort of taxation, then the tax rate should be somewhat higher than zero and somewhat less than 100. And it's a question, no, it, when, and, and it's really it's just- pretty big, pretty big. Larry, one. why is the index important to you? What is the index? Why? No, oh, yeah, I'm just saying, as, I'm just referring to John McCain's point about we have to change the alternative minimum tax. Okay. But rea well, not, well, my point is, that you can't just make that kind of comment. You have to look at tax policy in its totality. Because, yes, the alternative minimum tax clearly impacts people to whom it was never designed to impact. But I mean, secondly, yeah. uh, no, well, that's no question. But the question is, from the overall societal standpoint, how are you going to replace the lost yes. revenue yes. from the AMT if you eliminate it? Yes. Then there's going to be some other tax that's going to be implemented that is going, I mean, assuming it's the same level of government spending, that is going to be implemented. Uh, that's going to impact someone as well. The only thing, we, they're telling us we've got to take a break here. The only thing I would say is you're looking at taxation as a zero-sum game. If we cut taxes, we have to somehow raise them somewhere else. And I would propose to you that you have to take a principle of baking a bigger pie instead of trying to cut up the pie as much. And I think that's what this government has shown, and that's what this economy has shown time and time again. We're able to grow this economy, grow this economy incredibly. Do you realize that this economy has grown, I think it was in the last six years, we have grown two, so the two economies the size of China. In other words, our growth in this economy has increased what you see over in China, which is supposedly this incredible now, economic now tell that to the average man who's losing his jobs right now and losing Marty, his houses right now. Look, the unemployment rate right now is at historical lows. Performance put forth by the United States of America since Herbert Hoover. What's that? During George Bush's first term, yes. as far as job growth was concerned, it was the worst performance by the United States of America by a president's administration since that of Herbert Hoover. Well, well, Larry, I don't know. All I know Larry, is they set a new record for job creation. I believe it was 52 months in a row. Larry, Larry. set the previous record, which was uh, established by another Republican president, Ronald Reagan. Larry, we and have... Just leave it, uh, just let me leave you this last comment. I just want to make a comment on what you said about uh, corporations getting tax breaks. The reason they get tax breaks is because they're going to come in and hopefully be providing jobs to the city of Danbury that may go elsewhere. So again, you have to look at it in its totality. That if companies go to Danbury, they get some sort of tax abatement, they provide jobs to the local citizenry. Right? Okay, Larry. He's right, in the long run tax break. Right? We have to take a break. If you want to okay. call back, please do so. But I just want to say that Judge Bush is a moron, so, so that's explain why we in this debacle that we're in right now. All right, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll further discuss this. And if you want to call back, please do so, okay?
All right, thanks, Ivan. All right, thank you. Now covering Danbury, Bethel and Ridgefield local news with Austin Greenfield and weather with meteorologist Jared Root right here on Comcast Channel 23. Hey everybody and welcome to this edition of Ideas at Work and Beyond News and Weather. I'm Austin Greenfield alongside meteorologist Jared Root. Thank you. And I'm going to talk about an experience I had today. Early this morning I went down to the Fox News building. A good friend let me in there, and uh, I got to see a live show of the Mike and Juliet show. And I got front row seats. But then they actually had to be placed in a couple of Christians, and they had to throw me in the back when they had a topic about procreation. And uh, this, uh, this audience is very small. They only had five rows of people. Not a very big studio at all. It's probably four times the size of this studio that I'm in now. But it's a really cool show, and... Um, it's free to get in. All you have to go do is uh, log on to that website. I believe it's jnm.com or mnj. I think it's mnj.com, and uh, just go to the show and it'll give you a little form to sign up. But at that topic on procreation, they were talking about if we were sort of uh, how we procreated. Were we? Was it just like uh, having sex just for fun, or was it more of a? Just to procreate, I don't, you know, and that question is still uh, unanswered. I don't know. Was it different you're, back then? You're talking about now, or are you talking about back in? The I'm talking about thousands of years ago. Did they just have sex for pleasure back then, or was it to just pro procreate? Well, back then, I mean, until we don't have anybody living now, back that big live back then, right. but now, so we can't really say for sure. But I would wouldn't think what times how they changed. Uh, between now and then, everything's more advanced. People understand more now than they did last, you know, thousands of years ago. I would think back then there would be more, more. Uh, I would think more of uh, just procreate than now, where it's more where we use our our smarter knowledge just to experience you know, sex in a different way now. Yeah, I just think it's just a, because back then they just saw it as a means just to procreate and enlarging our species, but now since we have billions of people in this world, they're starting to enjoy it to keep going and keep having children to keep this world going. Yeah, and it's a very strong part of relationships. Yes, definitely. Well, let's jump into some weather before they kick us out of the studio. And uh, Jared, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, I don't think they want to really kick us out of the studio <laughs> because we got some good weather for the next couple of days, and today we had a great day. Uh, Austin, you probably knew when you were in New York City how it was yeah, very nice and warm. warm down here, nice and warm up here, temperatures up in the 70s. Tell us how high the temperature we get to. We got to a high of 75 degrees, Jared. That's way above the time here. No precip uh, in the bucket today. Our weather headlines show, well, chilly tonight. Again, not as cold, though. Uh, the excellent weather will continue into Friday and warmer, too. She will be going on Friday. You will not believe it. And well, does the weather and the warm weather and sunny weather will continue into next week? Well, Jared has all the. Hey, we're going to have a, a nice, clear, and quiet night. Not as cold as last night. Temperatures in the upper 30s 37 in Danbury and Ridgefield, 36 in Bethel. Friday, look at these temperatures sunny skies, warm, high temperatures around 80 here in Danbury. 77 in Bethel, 79 in Ridgefield. Our five-day forecast, that nice weather continues into Saturday. A little bit cooler, but still very nice. High temperature of 76. Changed by sun from the west. It's going to drop our temperatures a bit. Sunday actually is going to be mostly dry until the afternoon where the showers come in. 
But Monday, when we start off that new work week, looks like a pretty damp day. Cool temperatures around 59 degrees. And we clear it up by Tuesday afternoon with a high temperature of 66 degrees. Well, that does it with the news and weather. When we turn, we will join our program. Welcome back to Ideas at Work and Beyond. Uh, I, look, it's amazing, man. From politics to caveman sex. Yeah, what's up with that? It's supposed to be the news. Are we talking about caveman sex? A little, little anthropological <laughs> uh, soldier in there. I, I, you know, I don't know, man. I, I didn't really. That I got to get the tape on that because that yeah. looks like it might be, you know, fascinating. Anyways, so seven nine two four one zero one seven nine two four one zero one. We now, I just have know. to. I just have to, you know, check a little bit. You know, you're you're going over the public airways and, and you're calling our president a bad word. A and moron. You're saying, a moron. And you're saying he's, you know, done moron. I disagree. I mean, I granted it may not be a popular stand to say that uh, at the end of a second term, after we've been in a foreign war and the economy seems to be slipping at home, uh, maybe it's not that popular to stand up for our, our president. But I'll tell you, I'm proud of George W. Bush. When 9-11 uh, when happened and, uh, and he was standing on top of that pile of rubble and he had that um, uh, fireman with him, he said that we will, these terrorists will hear from us. He said that it's Did, a long second, war. Hold on for a second, Marty. Did, did, didn't he go like hiding somewhere in, um, you know, in a cave? No. And and right. while, while our firemen were like trying to protect us or something no, like that? No, no, and as a matter of right? fact, I, I saw Michael Moore's movie Fahrenheit 9-11, and he talked about how, you know, the president heard of it and he was reading books to school yeah. children and he didn't jump so, up so, and so immediately. So where did the Air Force take him? The Air Force, they have a, they have a safety plan anytime yeah. there's a national right, threat. Right, and right, you know what right, the, right. the... the cowboy went, you know, went hiding, right? No, the, no, no, we have two no. calls, we there have two calls. Secure... The cowboy no. went hiding no. while our police officers, the firefighters, all these great service people we're trying to protect us, and he went hiding. I couldn't disagree with you okay. more. I couldn't disagree with you more. There okay. are security procedures when there's something yeah, like that. security procedures. There's okay. security procedures, and That's do you know where he went? And where were the security it's, procedures? It's sort of interesting where he went. Where? He went from Florida and he got on Air Force One, mm -hmm. and they flew him to 30,000 feet in the air, and they had fighter jet escorts all the way. Mm -hmm. And they flew the plane to Nebraska, but then George W. Bush insisted, because mm -hmm. they knew that there were other planes in the air, and mm -hmm. they knew, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, the plane that, w that went down in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. was headed for the Capitol. Mm -hmm. It's true. Okay. So they knew that there were, there were increase, there had already been a plane that was flown into mm -hmm. the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and they knew that there were other planes unaccounted for mm -hmm. in the air, mm -hmm. so they're not taking them back to the White House. It's, it's a precautionary thing, okay. and I think for liberal uh, Democrats to somehow, uh, you know, uh, take issue with the man's bravery. I'm not taking, bravery. I'm not yeah, taking issue with the man's bravery. You said he, you said he hid is, and he didn't go okay, right down okay. to the pile and help the firemen. We have two calls. There we were security procedures and that's what he did. We have two calls. He got Look, down I'm to not. the pile pretty darn quick. And when he did, he said that this battle against terrorism is going to be long. Where was it's going to be hard. So, hold on, where was Rudy? Rudy Marconi had the no, not falling down. Not Rudy Marconi. Rudy Marconi. Where was Rudy? <laughs> Rudy was up here in Richfield. Uh, Rudy was Giuliani. Right there. Well, he's the mayor of New York City. Now, talking about bravery. Okay, we got two calls. Well, Rudy Marconi's a uh, Rudy, Rudy Color Giuliani your is a very brave guy. Color your name. Bravery? What did Rudy Giuliani do? He walked around New York and looked sad. He didn't uh, do at anything. At least he was there. Oh, come on. Rudy, run Rudy Giuliani had dust all over him. He was trapped in a building. He had to all right. find alternate Listen. exit routes out of the building. The and he was a rock of Gibraltar for the city of... <laughs> Uh, listen, uh, listen, New listen, York listen, through listen. that time. Right, buddy, you can't, you can't take that away from him. We have a call coming in, so, so be I, quick, I, I want to take think, that call. Do you think President Bush should have stayed in the White House knowing there were jets on the way in to go blow up the White House? Is that your view? Don't, don't. No, 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 that's not my view. I'm, 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 of course not, but, but, um, but all I'm saying is this, though. He, he, he went... I know what you mean. It's just a... Uh, back to the change of subject, Marty. You were talking about m more money in working class people's hands, yeah, and it generates more income for the government. What Absolutely. What is that term called? You know? What's that? 
What is that? What is that? Supply what is side economic economics. Process called? Supply side economics. Also, so the term is, is the velocity of money, and you've never convinced like the person. Man, these callers got some pretty impressive economic uh, 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 terms. Velocity of money. Okay. Velocity of money, and if to try to explain it to the last caller, it's like trying to teach quantum physics to a three-year-old. They just don't want to understand. Even though you cited chapter and verse, Kennedy did it, Reagan did it. Ivan, I want to go on your show with David Bonin and talk about energy. Why don't you come? Just I'll come. come. I'll, I'm waiting on. for you, man. We'll both ride over to the studio on my bike on our bikes. <laughs> All right. My bike is nicer than his. Okay. <laughs> want to talk. I know your Rastafarian buddy. His buddy is listening. So I'll come on. I want to talk about energy. We have more en we have more oil in Alaska and Utah. We could totally be self sufficient. But Thank we you. Can't, we can't drill for oil because you're a Democrat, dirtbag friends in the house. All right. Thank you. All right. I gotta go. Okay. Our wire again, but get them right. on the show. I want to debate, but he's he's afraid of me. He looks at me like he sees a ghost when he sees me in public. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. He's afraid of me. <laughs> Call your near. Hey, how's it going, Ivan? Hey, what's going on, Al? Oh, it's always a pleasure to hear the, the mindless babbling of Frank Monda from Bethel. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got to segue into kind of like uh, professional wrestling, oh don't you God. think? You know, bring your bucks and yeah, We could have like a, you know, we could have a uh, some sort of a. Oh, right, it, it, would, it would be my pleasure to see him face to face again. The last time I talked to him, he ran away like a scared little ghost. But um, I didn't call about that. Uh, the total waste of humanity. Let's talk about some local issues here in Danbury. We have. Please. All right, um, I'm going to throw a couple of subjects out. I just want to get your opinions on it. First of all, um, the first thing was. There's a report in the Danbury News Times about a report that was done by the National Low Income Housing Coalition called Out of Reach um, that said that any person that doesn't earn more than $27.90 an hour or $58,000 a year cannot afford a two bedroom apartment in the Danbury area. Mm. Um, so I want to find out your opinions about that. Well, I'll tell you, this uh, uh, one thing having to do with uh, this mortgage crisis is, is house properties, housing properties are, are plummeting. Do you realize that the average cost of a house in California came down 24%, 24% last year? I think what you're seeing is the free market at work. Housing prices were too high. People that wanted to afford mortgages but really couldn't can't. Those mortgages are being foreclosed on, and the cost of housing is coming down. Well, now, you're saying locally it isn't, but I'm telling you, these, um, these, these bad mortgages that, that messed everybody up, they're just giving mortgages away from people who couldn't afford the homes. Right. Um, that, that really uh, caused a big problem in the whole housing market. But, uh, you know, still, I mean, geez, you got $58,000 a year, you can't afford a two-bedroom apartment in the Danbury area. It's pretty tough. And I'm just saying renting. I'm not even saying owning a, uh, a home. Yeah. Um, That's true. Now, the second thing I want to talk about real quick is the, I don't know if you guys did it in Ridgefield, but we just went through in Danbury a, a bunch of revals. Yeah. You know, um, I don't, did you do that in Ridgefield? Yeah, we do. it. By state mandate, you have to do it every five years now. It used to be 10, but now it's every five. Yeah, it was a pretty hard hit on everybody in this area. Because they said your value of your property went up, so your taxes went up? Oh, yeah. Uh, the value went up a lot. Although the mayor is trying to hey. fumble around with the numbers to keep the mill rate kind of low or bring it down. He's trying to phase it in in different parts, but still. Well, the fact of the matter is, historically, if you own the roof over your head, and more and more Americans are doing that, it's the best investment you could ever make. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 24% drop in the California house prices notwithstanding. Long-term, is still hey, the best investment hey, you can possibly you know, make. Hey, it's, it's one thing to be a residential property owner. I, I would not want to be a commercial property owner because they, they take more of the burden. That's true. Hey, Al, yes. I have a question for both you and Marty. Do you think the government should, should um, interfere? Do you think the government should take our tax money and give to people who actually um, bought things that they didn't have any means to do. Well, but how is it that they couldn't a pay for it? Yeah, I think you're talking about um, bailing out um, with the Stearns, I forget the name of that mortgage company. Right, right. Bear right. Stearns. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you don't do something, you're going to have a bigger problem. Okay, so why don't we just take the loss? Because, because I mean, so, so, where, so where will we learn the lesson here? You, you, if you cannot afford it, don't buy it. it that's true. But, you know, if J you don't bail out, you know, 
organizations like Stearns, you're going to have yourself a bigger problem. Well, there's two, there's two questions. I think one question you're talking about is the average homeowner who's found himself in a mortgage that has kicked up and he can't afford it and he's going to foreclosure, should your tax dollars and my tax dollars come in and try to help out all these homeowners? My right. answer to that would be no. What he's talking about with Bear Stearns, and I remember back in the 90s, late 80s, they did it with the Chrysler Corporation, if you remember with Lee right. Iacocca, right. where the government did come in and, and they gave some assurances. And, and basically, it's not just hard, cold, hard cash, but it's sort of, you know, sort of a, a second signature on a loan uh, where they're putting the full faith and value of the U.S. government behind some of these uh, um, securities, and that's what I think they did with Bear Stearns. I do agree with you, Al, that, that that's good on a macro level. I, my general theory on all this is that the government should stay out of economics, that there's a great, uh, like uh, Adam Smith talked about the, in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, the invisible hand is at work. The invisible hand in the market, if house prices are getting too high, the invisible hand will come and supply and demand will be such that they'll come down. If there isn't enough housing, the prices go up and builders go out and build and eventually they overbuild and prices come down. So I think the government should stay the heck out of the economy as much as possible. Even the stimulus package, where we're all going to get these $700, $300, $400 dollar checks in the mail. I, I think the stimulus package is the, is the most outrageous thing I, ever. I mean, do you think that you're going to take the stimulus, do you think you're going to get this check and go out and, and go to the store? and buy some buy some stuff or are you going to use it towards your bills yeah that's the thing everyone's hoping you're going to go you know buy a new set of clothes or something like yeah. that but but again my my focus and, and i think this is the basic difference maybe with democrats and republicans republicans tend to say the government that governs least governs best and it should be hands off and that that you should do for yourself what you can the Democrats tend to think that, hey, I mean, when I would see Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton going out and stumping and speaking, they seem to think that government has the answer to all your questions. I'm telling you, government doesn't. If you want to get ahead in this world, the last thing you should do is go with your hand out to any state, federal, or local government. They're not your friend. They should deliver the mail, defend the borders, and that's about it. Uh, if you're looking for the government to get you ahead in life, you're looking at the wrong way. I had some involvement with kids in uh, inner city uh, South Norwalk and Bridgeport, and some of these high school kids, I tell them the same thing. Don't look to government. Look to the free enterprise. Look to the marketplace. Look to getting a profession, furthering your education. Don't look to a government handout to get ahead, because if anything, it just enslaves you further. Um, so, in answer to the question, should the government be involved in bailing out all these people that have had their houses foreclosed on, I think government has a role to play, but I don't think that they should come in and, and sort of usurp the market and try to artificially help all these people. It'll work itself out. There was a savings and loan crisis back in the 80s too, if you'll recall, where uh, they, they loaned too much money to build all these buildings. It worked its way out. Let the market work and it'll all turn out okay. Well, okay. Um, a, a few more quick local topics. I'll let you guys go because I, I want to try to keep it as local as possible. Cause it's we are dissecting the area. Um, the BRT um, is a developer. They're a de they developed a BRT Crosby Apartments um, that was originally supposed to be used for um, young adults to go in there and move in. BRT couldn't do it. And they turned around, basically turned into a dormitory. That place on Crosby Street got a seven-year tax deferral. Um, BRT was also supposed to build a housing complex on Kennedy. I think it was supposed to be 5,000 units, and they also got a seven-year tax deferral to do that. Um, but BRT seems to be somewhat reneging on the offer somewhat and is asking for the assistance of Avalon to come in there and help them out with the um, housing complex. Um, Given that, since there's going to be another developer coming in helping out BRT, do you think they should have to give back that seven-year tax deferral? Do you think that goes against the spirit of the reason why they got the deferral in the first place? You know I mean? Go ahead. My, my point of view on that is, you know, a deal is a deal, and if a municipality makes a deal with a developer, they should stick to that deal. Um, what you have to remember is once these developers build these projects, the town or the city of Danbury gets tax revenues from that project forever, uh, forever. And so it's, it's in their best interest to uh, welcome industry and, and developers to, to, the, um, to the city. I know in Ridgefield we did that with Bowringer Engelheim. 
Right. Uh, they're a huge pharmaceutical company. They're just uh, uh, building uh, thousands of additional square feet. They were debating whether they were going to build that here in Ridgefield, where we would get the tax benefit of that. As a matter of fact, Danbury gets some of that. Or whether they were going to do that in Arizona or South Carolina or some of their other plants. We were very aggressive, gave them a comparable, it seems like either five years or seven year tax deferral, and it's a great benefit to the taxpayers of Ridgefield on down the line. Um, and it's what you got to do. There's a competitive marketplace out there uh, between different municipalities trying to attract industry, clean industry, tax-paying industry um, uh, to their the towns and cities. And I think Mayor Bowden's doing a good job in that. Well, I, I think um, my only concern with that is is that the plans that the tax deferral was create uh, given to BRT has changed somewhat because the dynamics have changed because they're bringing in another developer to do this thing. So I, basically, in my opinion, is that I think this should go back to the Common Council just to look over one more time and make sure because with Crosby, we were told one thing that it's going to be used for young adults, and next thing you know, it's being used as a dormitory. Yeah, and well, well, that well, that's that you know, kind of annoys me a little bit. Yeah, that is unfortunate. But listen, we only have a few minutes. Wait, 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 one last thing, and I'm real quick. I'll, I'll be real quick because mm -hmm. uh, Marty's from Ridgefield. I want to know: Do you know anything what's going on with the FAA in the, um, the with the airplanes and the flight? Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you everything you need. Everything I know about the FAA. All right, the I'll, FAA I'll, is this huge. Update on that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go real quick. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, Al. Yes. Don't go yet. Don't go yet. Go ahead. Oh. The, the FAA is this huge monolith. They want to reroute planes uh, coming right up the gut of Fairfield County, literally right over Danbury, uh, Ridgefield, New Canaan, and Greenwich, and on into a glide pattern into LaGuardia and JFK. Supposedly, they've got this thing locked up. Some people say that trying to fight them is like trying to fight City Hall, that you can't do it. Uh, the town of Ridgefield has joined a consortium of, I think, I don't know, 12, 13 other towns to try and fight them. But I have not heard optimistic um, uh, predictions that they'll be able to fight the FAA. It looks like they're coming. Hopefully, they'll be high enough that they won't impact the quality of life around here. But to try to get them to re-reroute uh, these uh, uh, incoming flight patterns is going to be difficult, but we'll see. I think with these, if you got these flight patterns flying all over the place over our area, you got people who are complaining about the planes going to the Danbury Airport. That's as it peanuts is. compared to what we're talking about. You know, the, the planes going to the Danbury Airport is going to have to come down lower, so you're going to have more of a noise problem. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, hey, Al. Yes. Listen, um, earlier uh, we had a couple of callers, uh, well, one caller who called and complaining about. Um, um, city workers uh, taking city cars home, and, um, and and the mayor is complaining about the increased um, cost, um, you know, of gas. Uh, and one idea is that um, you know what? Why, why doesn't he drive his personal car to um, to work and then drive his personal car back home? Well, if I'm if I'm correct, and I, I could be wrong, but I think I'm correct. I think the mayor is driving a hybrid, testing out a hybrid vehicle for the city of Danbury. Okay, um, that's true. Right. I, I think that's why he's driving that car around right now. Okay. I think it's for testing purposes to see if the city of Danbury can save money by um, getting a fleet of hybrids. Okay. I, They're I, very I, I, environmentally I, conscious of our beloved mayor, don't you agree, Ivan? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think that's what it is. But that is yeah, right. absolutely, if you shouldn't be driving city cars home. I mean, that, and then other, also other city officials too, right? Well, workers, you know, whatever. Get, forget about the gas. Think about the maintenance and stuff you have to do on those yeah. vehicles as well. So, do do you know of any other things that they that they should cut to um to save money? Well, I, I don't think you have enough time in your show to go over any <laughs> all the things I think they can do to cut money. Yeah. Well, what's your what's your uh, website or blog site where people can go? Yes. Oh, okay. Give me a quick little shameless plug. Yes. yes. Hat City Blog. HatCityBlog.com. Hat City Blog. H A T, right? HotCityBlog.com. And of course, you can watch this show online also at the Ideas at Work and Beyond website at IAWAB.blogspot.com. Okay, that for the correct. record, uh, a plug for your blog does not indicate, you know, complete and utter 100% endorsement of everything that appears on there. Can we agree on that? Absolutely. Okay, okay. <laughs> but just in the, uh, you know, the. Care. Free uh, exchange of Thanks, ideas uh, and opinions at Idea Work and Beyond. We want to get it all out on the table. Now, let me say this. <laughs> you guys are too much. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Bye-bye. Okay. The now, good, the now, bad, let, let the me right, the wrong. If, if, you want, if you want some real, like, local, um, real issues of what's really going on, 
they should go to hotcityblog.com. I've been featured on that once before. Dot com. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's when you get all the real stuff because the news time, you know, there are certain things that they're allowed to say, but this guy, yeah. he, he's, he's hardcore. Takes the gloves off. Takes the gloves off, lets you know what the deal is. That's you know. right. Hotcityblog.com. Gotta Anyways. love the freedom of the press. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, yeah. Bloggers freedom are taking speech. over. Gotta hey, listen, um, it's time to go. It's time to go. Next week, we're going to have um, Andrea Gardner. She's going to talk about what's going on downtown Danbury. And I know um, you guys want to take your city back from the invaders, so-called alleged invaders. So, <laughs> And then anyway. after that... Uh, on, you know what's um, so funny? I they made sold, one. let me say, like, in the 80s, they sold downtown Danbury right. Right, yeah. to, to the mall. Right. And then, and then they claim that people are coming in to invade downtown Danbury. I don't you know, know about it's that. Like they first sold it. I like Danbury. And it was dead like a zombie. Right? May 1, Mayor Bowden uh, is most likely coming in. May 1, and so that'll be an interesting show. And then after that, uh, there may be a series of show uh, May 8th. It might be on the pol new police station in Ridgefield. And possibly Rudy Marconi, not to be confused with Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Marconi, first selectman of Ridgefield, may be joining us on May 15th. But stay tuned. Some of those dates may be juggled a little bit. All right. See you later. Thanks, Rudy.